to it. Uh, that seems like a good level. There we go, back to this. Okay, what were we doing? Well, that's why I made the list. Uh, somewhere. Um, so many tabs. There we go. Okay. So, yes, issue. This issue. Um, so, a couple things happening right now. One is that I'm, I'm doing some video uploads to... Uh, which is actually maybe not the best idea considering I'm streaming right now, but hopefully my internet will handle it. Um, to get to the point where we will see a quota error from the API, uh, which seems to happen after uh, uploading a couple of videos. All right, so we were at 3200. Let's see if that's changed. Still at 3200. Is it? So that should be, um, if I remember from the API docs, it was like, was it 1600 per upload? Videos, insert, quota cost was 1600. Okay, so that's two videos. Um, which if we look at the tasks here, yeah, we're still processing those two videos. And then the third one is queued up. So it'll take a few video uploads to get to the point where we'll see the quota. So let's let, let's come back to figuring out what the actual error looks like and handling it. Let's, um, let's just assume that that part is done. So we'll not change anything in the, um, in the YouTube upload API just yet. Let's just define what we should be looking for in its response and add that handling into the task worker. And we'll just focus on um, making changes in the task worker to handle this. So uh, I want to look at my list of issues here in uh, VS Code. There's the new one, number 95. Uh, we'll create a new branch to work on it. And um, I think, yeah, so what, what should the error look like? Like we, uh, so what I'm thinking is I probably don't want to make it so that the client can return a 200 but then have some stuff inside. I think it's gonna make more sense for there to be a specific HTTP code that we use. Maybe, what's, what's gonna make sense, right? So is there, maybe it's any kind of 500 code, any kind of server, right? If it's a, f so, HTTP status codes, how do they work? So there's a bunch of different status codes. And generally, in the, the, the way this code works, the way that it does, where it's looking for a status within 200 to 299 is because generally, all of the statuses mean some kind of success, some kind of things went okay. Um, I think really 200 and 201 are uh, kind of the most common ones. There are other ones. Um, and then, Generally, like 300 series codes uh, are some kind of redirect kind of thing um, and may or not be a success. They're, they're things that you would probably want to explicitly handle. Um, and so we're just going to say if it's not a 200 to 299, something weird has happened and we're just going to give up. We're going to mark the task as failed and we're going to give up on the task. Um, and then, generally speaking, and then 400 series codes are some kind of client error. So the thing calling, so like this task worker, or the thing that queued up the task has made some kind of error. And we probably don't want to automatically retry in those cases because we're just going to retry and it's still going to be a client error. 
um, we just need to give up and the the user or the thing that's queuing up the task needs to do something different. If it's a 500 error, that's generally some kind of server error, right? So that's something where um, the, uh, like the, some infrastructure in between this code and the server that we're talking to is down, like a proxy or uh, is down or the the service um, is getting, you know, I don't know, YouTube is down, Google is down, um, the database is unavailable, something else that might be temporary, but so that there's, there's two paths here that I see, right? One is a kind of really narrow, where we defined one specific HTTP, HTTP status that we'll use as a signal that we should retry. Um, and that's like gonna be specific to this, this code. We'll say that any of, the, any of the APIs that I'm writing here will return that code and that, <laughs> yeah, you're welcome, uh, Furiago. Um, then that, that, um, um, trains of thought are so hard to catch. Uh, the, right, so three paths, right? So one would be, there's a specific status that will have my code return when this task worker calls it. Option two is to pick a set of statuses that are like, Oh, these 500 kind of statuses, like, um, hold on, let's, let's just, it's, it's much easier to like here, HTTP status codes costs. There we go. We got, we got all sorts of things. And this, this basically summarizes the thing that I just said, right? So, uh, you don't see a lot of 100 to 199 successful responses, redirection messages, client errors, server errors. So 500, it's just general error. 501 not implemented. Um, 502 bad gateway. 503 service unavailable. 504 gateway timeout. Um, 505 HTTP version not supported. Right. So the middle road would be to say. Um, pick certain statuses and say, oh, these statuses make sense as kind of a, we should retry them. Like maybe bad gateway and service unavailable and gateway timeout, but not HTTP versions not supported or uh, loop detected, those shouldn't be retried, right? So pick some, or alternatively, we could just say any kind of 500 error, just retry it. And then if we don't have some specific indication of what, when it should be retried, we would um, pick, you know, retry in an hour or something. Um, I think um, maybe just option one, just saying 503 service and available is the signal that my service will use and we'll just only deal with 503 service and available. And specifically we'll look for the HD, the retry after header in the response if it's there. And if it's not there, we'll pick an arbitrary amount of time to wait. Um, I think that is the way to go. Uh, that is that is my feeling on that. Because if I, so why does that matter? Yeah, so I think it sounds like a good plan, but why does it matter, right? So if I, if I did kind of option two or option three, um, I have other services that are going to potentially return like a 500 error if the thing that they're doing fails or like if I hadn't gotten around to changing because I haven't yet. So if I don't get around to changing this, this is going to return a 500 error if anything goes wrong. Um, if I were to say any kind of 500 to 599 error, any of those errors uh, should result in a retry. Um, that could be good, but that might, you know, do, uh, that might be surprising, I guess. It would be different from what's going on right now. Whereas if I choose to use 503, nothing in my code is currently returning a 503 in these microservices. 
Um, so that's going to be much more explicit about when it's going to invoke this behavior. Um, so how do we do this? So we need to do something here because we already have a thing checking to see if it's, if it's not 200. Um, So I could add some code in here, right? And say, okay, well, it's not 200. Is it, is it uh, a 503 error? But I could also instead do that up here, right? If it's a 503 error specifically, I do something and then I skip doing everything below, right? Or um, I could do other things where I like pull this part of the logic out somewhere else. I think for now, I'm going to just say, hey, if uh, if the response is a uh, 503 service available, then, um, then what? Then what are we doing? So I think what we need to do is we have this thing called task status. It's queued, it's processing, it's complete, it's failed, it's valid. So I think we're gonna need a new status that's gonna be, um, maybe we don't. Maybe we don't. Maybe we just leave it as processing. I think that's, leaving it as processing is going to make some of the logic simpler. <laughs> Well, thank you uh, for saying so. Um, this is something where being good at this means thinking it through. And um, probably the most rigorous way of thinking something through, in, 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 in my experience, is just to like talk it all out. So that's what I'm doing. Um, because there's always more than one, one way. In fact, a lot of different ways of doing the same thing. Even like when we're focused on just a little bit of code, there's lots of ways. There's lots of ways of doing it. So, um, I don't think I want to update the status. What I want to do is I want to, um, Mark task. So if we're here, then the task is already in a uh, processing status. Hey, Brainless. Good morning. That's a cute emote. Um, we're already in a processing status because we set the, the task to processing when we started it. So I think what we need to do is we need to set the task back to queued. That's the, the, the status before it. Uh, I'm doing well, doing well. Just uh, working through the problem. <laughs> How are you doing? Um, task as queued. Again and at, we're going to do th three things. We're going to change the status back to queued. We're going to um, add a retry. Um, delay and break and with a comma there and break. There we go. Uh, very sleepy. I need to make myself an espresso. Yes. I've already had my morning uh, two shots, so uh, I have to wait till after lunch. Moody Abigail, I see you're still around after your your lurk earlier. How's it going? <laughs> what is the? Oh, I see Turbo, and then I see I see Happy Sunday, uh, Lady Versailles. I hope this weekend has been good to y'all. Yeah. I hope everyone has had 
uh, a good weekend so far. I, uh, it's been all right. What did I do yesterday? Uh, read some fanfic, played some, um, uh, the Planet Crafters. That's about it. Is this, so is this, is this Cody that, uh, um, uh, GitHub Copilot suggested any good? So it's gonna to check to see if response to status is equal to request that status code service unavailable. That might be real. Service unavailable is the kind of the message that corresponds to 503. And then it's going to try to update the task status to queued. That looks right. It passes the connection to Redis and then the task and then the, the new task status. And then it causes the whole process to panic if it fails to do that. Um, and then this is trying to like sleep, right? To just wait. Uh, we're not doing that. This this could be good. Um, what I want is actually kind of a mixture of those two uh, things. Because I do want some of this. Oh, I can't copy from there. That's unfortunate. Uh, so I'm going to take this. And then uh, I'm going to read that message in a second. We're going to get rid of this. And then, um, OK. So I'll take the task status. Um, put the. Put the message back in the queue. All right, what's going on? Jake here? underscore jar dash and just subscribed Jake. for five months. Thank you for the resub. Um, <laughs> that that is a that is an interesting emote thing going on there. Uh, five months. Thanks so much. And then Brainless said, "I'm so conflicted. A good friend and ex coworker is convincing me to apply for a job." Uh, at his current company, which should be over 3x my current pay. Uh, on one side, so much more money. On the other, I am happy with my current one. I mean, you could be happy there too, right? You just never know. Um, I mean, I... <laughs> hey, Snowy283, how's it going? Welcome in. Um... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's tough, right? Because I I'm doing well. Uh, just tr trying to process Brainless's uh, conundrum here. Um, I mean, if you're happy where you're at, I mean, I guess the question is, could you be happy there too? And and it's really, if you can get a good sense of like your uh, co-workers in the company. Snowy283 just followed. Thank you for the follow as well. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, Jake has has an interesting point as well. All right, so what are we doing? So is this is this actually a thing that exists? It looks like it. Yes. Okay. So Copilot gave us some some maybe working code. I think. Do I have? Do we need to put the, so we have a remove task from temp queue function. Yeah, that part is very appealing. Um, so how does this work again? So we are, we have a queue name, we pop task, right? So pop task is a, is a function that I had wrote, uh, written a while ago that apparently still has it to do. Um, we, we are uh, popping an element from the list pushing it to another list and returning it. And it's a, a blocking operation, right? So we are moving the task, um, the ID or the, the key of the task from the main queue to a temporary queue. And then we're getting the task and we're like 
putting it into this uh, into this struct. Um, so we want to, and then this function removes the task from the temp queue. So what I'm missing here is a function that will undo uh, pop task that will take the message, the, the task from the temp queue and put it back on to the end of the main task queue, um, which is the kind of what we ended up, uh, well, we could have here. All right, so let, let's look at these side by side really quick. Is this undoing this? Oh yeah, now I remember. So that's why I turned off notifications um, before, was so that I wouldn't have stuff popping up uh, on coding streams because I'm doing like a desktop, uh, like a full screen capture. Uh, but it's comp <laughs> compromises. Um, okay, SOC DIR left, desk DIR right, source key, Okay, so let's think about this. Pop task is going to read from the main queue from the right hand side. For some reason, I guess that means that when we when we queue up a task, we're putting it on the the left hand side. So it's first in first out. Is that is that how that works? We should have a function somewhere here that um, puts the message on the, oh, something failed. This is Rust, yes indeed. Um, I've been working on this project for, uh, oh boy, I guess about six months now, uh, which has been my first project in a number of years, getting back into Rust. So we have, uh, I have a kind of a smattering of uh, kind of levels of <laughs> competence when it when it comes to this, but uh, I'm, I'm have been getting back into the swing of things. All right, I'm gonna guess that uh, we're gonna see more of these statuses, these tasks failing. Oh yeah, yeah, not the Rust game. That's that's why the tag on the stream is like Rust Lang. Uh, you're learning Python and C sharp. Nice. Uh, are those your your first languages, or is that your like working on a project or something and, and want to use those, or um, something else? Yeah, Python's good. Um, the, the very first version of kind of some of, some of this code was in Python using using Django um, before I decided I want to do some other things. Uh, they kind of are my main languages. All right, so just get it, getting started with those then. C++ has a lot of uh, a lot of history that and C but uh, they're not languages that I would choose to use these days um, in all honesty yeah 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 it does <laughs> yeah because you gotta import like um, what IO stream and then you gotta, yeah things All right. How how are we getting the task originally onto the queue? Gosh, there's. Hmm. Let's let's go back to. Oh yeah, yeah. Let's go back to the task API. Is that that'll try? Well, let me get it through. Uh, yeah. Console right line. Yep. Uh, and even less in Python, just uh, print. I think you might be missing a quote, but I get your point. 
Uh, okay, so in our task API, there is a endpoint create. There's a create handler. And we get the queue name from the environment. And we uh, increment the task counter to get a new task counter ID. Uh, yeah, what is that? Is that um, is that Elixir Brainless? Or is that Haskell? Elixir, <laughs> okay. It, it could be either, I don't know. I have I have literally just hours of experience with Elixir, and it's it's been on stream, um, however long ago that was at this point. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I'll push is where we are putting the task key into the queue. So we're putting it on the left side of this list in Redis, um, and so then when we are popping the task, we are reading it from the right hand side. So it's like a first in first out queue, right? So we're putting things on the left hand side and we're taking them off the right hand side. And then we're putting um, the the thing that we are going to be processing into a temporary queue. This is, this is the, the work in progress because there might be multiple workers. Um, it's gonna be putting the, um, the, tempor the, the thing that's being worked on in this temporary queue on the left hand side. So if we want to undo that, what we need to do is we need to take the, well, that's interesting, right? Because it's not, we can't just take the leftmost item or the rightmost item from the temporary queue. We need to take this item. For that matter, do we, do we clean up? Yeah, we do remove task from temp queue. So that's in, in here, isn't it? We use LREM, removes the first count occurrences of elements equal to the value from the stored, from the list stored at key. Okay, so that's what we need to do. We need to use this function still up here, uh, up here. So it's not enough to just um, do this. We need to put, uh, we need to put the task ID in the main queue. So that the task can be re, um, retried at some point in the future, right? Um, the task worker will be able to find it again and process it. Um, is there is there an order that we need to do this in? I think we need to remove. Hmm. Hmm. So what I'm thinking about now is if this worker were to simply put the task ID back into the main task queue, then immediately some other worker would see it um, and be able to start working on it. We don't quite want that. Um, we need to, before we do that, we need to update the task. to put the retry amount, add um, yes. Not like that, but but something we need to update the record in Redis to say, hey, now this shouldn't be retried until some point in time. 
uh, right, so not a value, a timestamp. That way, once I have, uh, once we put the task ID back into the main queue, any worker that picks up the task, let's say there weren't any other tasks, right? Let's say there was only one task in the system. So the queue, the main queue would be empty at this point. The temporary queue would have the one item in it because we were trying to process it. When we called the API to process the task, then we got a 503 back and we're like, okay, well, we need to retry this. We need to put a timestamp into the record to say, okay, don't bother retrying this until this point in time. Then we put the task ID back into the main queue. Um, and then we remove it from the temporary queue. What was the purpose of the temporary queue again? What what do we, I mean, besides removing the task from it later, I think the idea of the temporary queue was that then we have a, a way to find tasks that might be lost. Like if something were to fail in the task worker, um, I guess the temporary queue is essentially like, um, like a dead letter queue, except it has items in it that are being processed. So if the worker fails in a way where we're not putting the task back on the main queue, we at least have a place to look for those tasks. I don't think I've implemented that work <laughs> to do anything about the temporary queue, but I think that's the idea. So it is a, it is a, a, a fail safe mechanism that hasn't been fully implemented yet. Which, hey, it's better than nothing. Maybe. So the question is what is gonna make the most sense? And I think the, what's gonna make the most sense is going to be to, um, to do that at the end, to remove it from the temporary queue at the very end, because if anything fails before that, we'll still have the task in that, that temporary queue. I'm doing air quotes that you can't see, but um, it probably, maybe we should rename it. So it's not the temporary queue, it's like the, the <laughs> I don't know, something. Yeah. I don't need that parent there. Okay, so that, that happens. Um, so the question is gonna be, like update task status is a function that updates the, the record. And it uses um, con each set to set the field last updated in the task. And then it does publish task status and it does con set okay so we're setting fields okay I think that's fine um, like so I'm debating whether I want to have like I probably don't want to extend this function to have it do more do I want to have it do less <laughs> do I want to have another function that uh, wraps this process and also adds the retry timestamp. I don't think so. Um, let's do this. Let's create a function. Call it. Um, let's see. Pub con. No. Um, set task. We try timestamp. Okay, let's see what Copilot gave us here. Um, no, no, this is not what I want. Right, because we want retry timestamp to be a parameter here. Um. 
probably not an i64. It's a Chrono date time, an UTC, something like that. So we'll do uh, H set on the task, and we'll use a, a field called retry timestamp. I think what I what I do want to do is I want these functions. I still have a lot of to dos on these, but generally I want to have them return a result like this. the The worker that's calling this function is going to just panic anyway because that's um, I'm just going to have the worker crash if something goes wrong. But um, So this is going to be like this. Match. That's that parent. What is the what is the issue here? Ah, I see. Um, so result. Oh, I see. Right. So this needs to be okay, and then this needs to be that. There we go. And that's valid code, right? Because we need to, for the result type, the the final expression, because this isn't in the semi, semicolon, it's an expression, um, needs to either evaluate to this OK uh, type from result or the error. So we're translating like, um, okay of some type whatever whatever we're getting from H set into an okay of a, of a unit type so just like an empty uh, result uh, or we're translating this this redis error into just like a string error describing it because we don't need to um, surface the redis error from from this function um, and then okay we're going to check is this is this valid seems like it save that yeah i mean i'm not using it yet but th this could be fine um let's go back to the mdn docs really quick so the retry retry after http header it seems estimated time before recovery of the service uh what is the what is that retry after headers um ah it can be an http date or a delay seconds, right? So it can be like this, or it can be like this. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say response. Interesting. So we get one version from Copilot where it's just going to assume that it's parsable as an integer. So we get a number of seconds. We get another version. Uh, okay, signed versus unsigned. Unsigned is probably fine. Um, I don't like this. Let's uh, let's do something else. Instead of trying to parse this as a as an integer, let's do this, and then we'll say um, let retry timestamp is we'll use match. Let's see if we can get Copilot to give us something helpful here. Um, so we can try parsing it as uh, as a number. If there's an error, yeah, we could do things. Um, we could continue to try to match, to parse it as a timestamp. 
Um, and we're missing braces here. Yes. Um, there we go. So we'll trace an error. Um, not an error. Info. And we shouldn't, like, we shouldn't throw an error if we don't find the retry after header. Um, what if we did this? What does this look like? Um, ba -ba -ba -ba, or... What does this macro opt be? Is that a thing? That's not a thing. Um, why or an option of a header value. I see. Uh, is there like a map? Okay, and now we have an option. Ooh, actually... Yeah, that can be good. Right, so, um, I don't know about defaulting to zero there. I think defaulting to an empty string, because I want to trigger the, the failure to parse, the failure to like do anything so that we hit here. Um, so now retry timestamp is a, is a string reference. And then, Right. Um, this arm needs to take that timestamp and convert it into. <laughs> you know I'm not. But thank you for the prompt. Uh, I do. We talked about. Uh, maybe it's been a while now, a month or two. Getting um, um, a second webcam. Well, yeah, practically a second webcam because I have the other one that I'm not. I'm not using for coding streams because. I don't want to be on camera in the morning, but I guess my fingers could be, and we could show this keyboard <laughs> on stream, uh, and you can see all of my fumbles. Uh, but yeah, I'm using this uh, this Moonlander um, ZSA Moonlander keyboard. So it's like a split ergonomic keyboard with a stand. Um, it's a uh, using a Colmac layout, so not, not QWERTY, not Dvorak, even weirder, um, that I've been trying to get used to for the last six months or so. Yeah, well, I just need to find a good one and then set up a, like a mount for it, because it would need to be mounted maybe on my, on my monitor tree at the top, so it would be looking down. Uh, but yeah, that could, that could be a thing. Um, so I want to construct a chrono date time here, I think. Does that work? Um, like this gives me an I-64. That gives me an offset. Can I? Yeah. It's just I think. Yeah, we'll look, we'll look at the logs in a second because I'm curious about what's going on there. But we'll, we'll do Chrono. Um. You 
UTC from, is that gonna work? I need a comma. Uh, expect UTC found I64. What does it mean? I64, timestamp here is a U64. Um, expected. Ah, um, this is what I'm looking for. Date time from timestamp. What, what have we got here? It takes two arguments because it has seconds and nanoseconds. Um, we don't we don't have any nanoseconds here, so that'll be zero. Um, and then it's unhappy because uh, there's two commas. There we go. All right, so this part is good. So this is going to give us uh, option date time UTC. And then, but this arm of the of the match is is giving something else, right? So we're gonna parse. Match arms have incompatible types. Expected enum option date time UTC found type I64. Um, that's interesting. Oh, right, because we're doing timestamp at timestamp. Uh, we don't need to do that. We can just do that. Okay, what's it complaining about now? Uh, expected option date time UTC found date time UTC. So this. Um, this is maybe a date time, or it could fail to generate a date time from the timestamp. Um, according to the type, like from timestamp gives a option of self, where self is this, this type. Um, so yeah, it returns none on an out of range number of seconds or invalid in a seconds, otherwise returns some date time. Um, in the context of the task worker, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to force the issue. I'm going to, I'm going to use a dot expect to cause it to panic if this doesn't work. And that means that yeah, so the issue is that that potentially the number of seconds from this value of timestamp plus the number of seconds from the, the the representation of the current date and time expressed as a number of seconds could overflow, I think is the idea. Um, and so this could fail. And so generally that failure is handled. We have a, an option, so either it will work or it won't. Uh, and what I'm saying here is if it doesn't work, go ahead and just cause the whole program to crash. That's what dot expect does here. Um, in Rust, um, it's called a panic. So in the context of this particular program, so the task worker, I do want any kind of unusual circumstance just to cause the pro process to crash. Um, because we'll, what we'll do is we'll have multiple workers running and they can be restarted and they're in, in practice, like if this was deployed somewhere, if this was an actual product and whatnot, you'd have monitoring, you know, things. Um, but by doing that, I convert the option into the underlying type. So then I get an actual date time. Um, now this is wrong because th this can't be zero instead. Uh, and I don't want it to be now either. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, we're going to say, let's see, how do I want to do this? Yeah, we're going to do something like this, but what we're going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to just create a a, um, is const the thing? There we go. Um, 
Hey, uh, Lady G, how's it going? How have you been? Um, let's call it default. Retry. Delay. And it's going to be that. is I can add that value to the current time. And so now the only issue is that I'm not using retry timestamp. So retry timestamp is this value that represents when we want the task to retry. So that was that was a lot <laughs> just to get to that. What's this complaining about? We're not using E. Um, is, it, is that essential? Oh, I see. Um, I don't, I don't care about that, that error for parsing the integer. So we'll just ignore the, the contents of the error. Uh, presumably if we fail to parse, um, the value from the HTTP, HTTP header as an integer, it's because it wasn't integer. Um, so that's fine. So now what are we doing with this? Well, we're going to call set task retry timestamp. So we're going to pass it the connection to Redis, uh, which is our data store. We're going to pass the task and we're going to pass uh, the calculated retry timestamp. Um, and this is complaining because we're not importing that function from the other file. So now we are. And save it. All right, no more error there. Um, okay, so this gets us to the point where when we, when we call the service, if it returns a 503 error, then we either use the uh, retry after header that's returned in that error response, or we um, don't find that, in which case we will uh, use the default retry, default retry delay uh, currently of one minute. So every minute we'll retry to, uh, to do the thing. Okay. So we set that and now we can put the task back into the main queue. Um, like so. All right. So we're just going to add the task key into a uh, queue name coming from up here where we get it from the environment so we're, we're in the in the docker compose configuration for the service we're telling it what the name of the queue is where everything is uh, working and then uh, then we can remove it from the the temp queue and then we break and so the break here is breaking this inner loop so the there, there are two loops here so this loop, uh, and honestly, yeah. So let's let's add a little bit of comments here, right? Um, take a task from the queue, and then um, and then what? So we loop while the cursor is not null. What does that mean? Well, um, then while the task um, um, while the target, oops, I hit I hit tab and I accepted accepted what a uh, copilot. Um, yeah, there we go. While the target uh, URL sure returns a cursor. Store the data from the data key in the task, yeah, and update the task status to complete, um, and uh, call 
target your cursor until the cursor is null. Is the explanation here, right? Um, I think with the word wrapping here, it's going to make sense for me to do it like this. Until cursor is not. Okay, so that's the that's kind of the what this outer loop is doing, or what the like. Once we get here, we are taking a task. We are processing the task until the task is done, and until the task is done means what's going on in this inner loop. So if we break the inner loop, we are short circuiting. We're stopping working on the task. Um, an implication of this is that if we were working on a task that had multiple like steps that it was returning a cursor and we were iterating over it we were processing the task in multiple steps so we were looping multiple times in this inner loop if we get a 503 error and we do all of this oops <laughs> don't click and drag um, if we do all of this when we come back and process the task again, it's going to, where is it gonna start from? Um, because we don't save the cursor back into the task. Like the, the cursor is state that's internal into this process. So that's going to be lost. Is that true? Task.payload, what is task here? 